Welcome back. Blake Cousins here at Third Phase Moon. We've got a special report. Incredible sightings coming in from around the world. And we speak with director James Fox in his explosive documentary. It's being held as one of the most credible examinations of a long-standing cover-up and a global mystery involving unidentified aerial phenomenon. But before we get to that, let me share you with this, a video that has just come in to me via my Facebook. His name is Dean Krillin, and he sent me this video from England, and he doesn't have any idea what it is. Let's just roll it, and we also have his video testimony. Check it out. I reached out to Dean and I said, you got to film yourself and I want to get your testimony explaining to us what happened and Dean obliged us. Here it is. You right there, Brett, Blake, uh, first face of the moon. Yeah, the video like, that I took, it was Sunday the 13th of September. It was in England on the Isle of Sheppey. I was out with my family walking the dogs. It was about half eight. Um, just sitting on the rocks watching the kids play and that and then uh, I'm always looking up in the sky I've seen some strange stuff but never been able to catch anything I was just looking out at the wind turbines and uh, see like this little black dot so I grabbed the camera zoomed in and as you can see well, there's this thing going mental and the, well, like you say the first thing you do you're trying to debunk it yourself like is it a drone it didn't look like any drone to me then I did actually think it was a kite but then, if you look that far out, you couldn't see anyone out there. Like, I mean, it's in the middle of the ocean. So, well, then I thought perhaps it got caught up in the turbine or something. But it started off on the right, going up and down, up and down. It was like, like you said, it looks like a kite. But then it started moving towards the left, and it was like as if it was going along, checking all the turbines out. Sometimes it would disappear, then it'd come back. But yeah, this was about 30 to 40 minutes this thing was buzzing about. Uh, I, I mean, I, I can't work out what it is. So that's why I sent it to you, see if it stick out to viewers, see if anyone got any other ideas. But that's all I can give you, really. I'll, I'll keep looking and I'm always seeing stuff, but it's, it's trying to catch them on the camera. They're too bloody fast. Okay, well. Thanks and check this later. Keep up the good work at all, boys. We've been asking the public a lot to videotape themselves and send us their testimony. It really helps. We appreciate it. It takes a lot of guts coming forward. Um, now we're looking at the video again. I'm getting the enhancements, uh, trying to slow it down, getting a little closer look and grabbing the best parts of his video. He has about six minutes, maybe 10 minutes of this object. It's been out there for a while, but I'm grabbing the best parts. He, he was struggling to capture it. He said this thing was moving super fast through the skies, out there in the ocean, next to the windmills. Uh, what are we looking at? Some people are already stating that this looks like a kite, but uh, we're gonna get even closer look at it when I slow the video down. Brent, before I do that, I wanna get your thoughts. What do you think's going on here? Yeah, it's just weird. It's over the ocean. Who's out there flying a kite? It's almost impossible. But again, it looks like that, but it's doing these erratic maneuvers and turning and bobbing. Unlike your conventional kite, here's a slow motion, Blake, getting a good close up. It has the characteristics of a kite, but look at it as I do a still photograph from it and we're looking at it closer. You see these uh, cells on it, but we're not seeing, again, it's very bizarre underneath. Where's the string? Where's the string? Where, who's piloting this thing or basically who's holding the string? 
out in the middle of the ocean. It'd be, it's pretty bizarre. And then Dean's description, he basically hasn't seen anything like this in the coastline. You would think he'd know what it is, but yeah, he's a security guard. He's a reputable source. Look at this close up again. Have you seen any kite like this? It looks like a drone. Actually, I did some uh, study on kites today just to see if I could find this, uh, if this is a kite, its model. And I haven't found one that looks exactly like this. Uh, I'm not saying it could be a kite, but I'm not saying it isn't a kite either. This is, it's weird. Maybe you could help us out and find out. Yeah, new high tech sort of uh, kite hybrid that we haven't seen yet. Absolutely, we're finding out about a lot of things just like last night's video. Uh, everybody thought this was the big uh, mothership over New Jersey and we found out uh, within minutes that it was a blimp. So we're able to confirm things. So if anybody out there has seen this kite or if it is a kite, uh, show me a light kind of it and maybe we'll solve this mystery. I, I wanna appreciate uh, Dean for sharing us his testimony along with these videos. He asked for help. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to solve mysteries here. And speaking of mysteries, James Fox has been trying to solve the biggest mystery of them all. And he's got an incredible documentary coming out. And we're excited to share with you this interview that we had with him a few months ago. But we're happy to share it with you now. It's going to be worldwide uh, digitally available. October 6th, Blake. And it's looking good. And I like what we saw. We had a sneak peek of this. The phenomenon. So... I suggest everybody take a look at this and listen to this interview with uh, James Fox. My gosh, look at this thing. The question is no longer if they are here, but why. What are they doing? What do they want from us? What are their motivations? There are cases that are not explainable in conventional terms. That have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. When we got right up to it, it lit up. Was this a warning? Was this an attempt to communicate? Felt scared. I was running and playing, and then I saw this maroon color in the sky. It was not anything from this earth. He was looking at all of us. Maybe they're trying to communicate. They were reaching out to us. There is an immense array of unanswered questions and an urgent need to get to the bottom of it. The public has a right to know. The question is no longer if they are here, but why. What are they doing? What do they want from us? What are their motivations? For over 75 years, there have been sightings in the sky. The UFO shut down several missile silos in Montana. Thousands of witnesses worldwide. It had to be a data collection. I'm sure they scanned the warhead. Just kind of hovering there. It never changed its longitudinal axis. And then it goes poof and it takes off off the side. And high level cover ups. The government was covering up what happened at Roswell. Hiding these dark secrets. I was told there wasn't anything there when I knew there was. People need to know there is something else out there. Yes, there have been visitation, crashed craft, material recovered. Shouldn't we be spending some money to study all these phenomena? I knew this was breaking news for the front page of the New York Times. They were trying to communicate, trying to tell us something. Now it's time to tell people about it. These things are real, they're here, this is happening now. The Phenomenon, showing in theaters nationwide this September. We're excited to have the filmmaker behind the amazing production known as The Phenomenon. The director, James Fox, is with us, and we're gonna go over the 70 years of history right up to the French discoveries that changed everything as we know it. It opens up providing the shocking hidden history that began in the late 40s and 50s when fleets of UFOs appeared in the skies over nearly every state in the US, culminating in a flyover of Washington, DC. This documentary includes never-before-seen archival footage and it's beautifully shot 
with new interviews deploying high caliber journalism and edge of your seat storytelling that takes audiences on a revelatory journey that leads them to unsettling, unavoidable conclusions that we're not alone. Now, let's get to James. He's with us and we're live and we're doing it. James, thanks for joining us right here at Third Phase of Moon. Thanks for having me on. You know, uh, it is a pleasure. It's been a few years since uh, you've been on the show, and it's good to have you back. I know you've been busy. Uh, you spent some time on these documentaries. You got this new one coming out, The Phenomenon. Uh, let's just get straight to the point. What's the most incredible thing that you're going to find out when you watch this documentary? we got a sneak peek at it, and you're revealing documents that I've never seen before. You know, this, I've had a handful of private screenings. And with some people that have very little to no background on the phenomenon at all. And we're dealing also with close encounters of the third kind, which is an aspect of the phenomenon that I've avoided in the past. But um, everyone who's walked out of the theater, I think I had the last screening we had was about 120 people. They didn't say, gosh, I'm not so sure that event actually happened or that landing happened. It's like, oh my God, that's why they're here. <laughs> Something like this. So I think that... Uh, you know, we're with the help of people like Jacques Vallée, George Knapp, um, really, really good writers and researchers. We're putting the pieces of the puzzle together uh, to make it presentable to mainstream. Um, and it's working. When you're bringing out some of the big wigs like uh, Podesta and other people that worked in the government that are basically stating that there's something out there that we don't know and uh, you, you're doing a great job uncovering it i can't wait for the people uh, to watch this uh, incredible documentary one of my favorite parts is when you go to zimbabwe and meet with the kids that had this incredible sighting that just uh, shocked the whole school where a flying saucer and an alien visited them on the school grounds what did you make of that when you went to visit these these kids uh, years later you see it in their eyes something something happened yeah so l let me back up on that one because i i remember hearing about it in the 90s when i was working on my first documentary ufos uh 50 years of denial and i was just naive enough at the time to think that i could get an interview with steven spielberg and we had a mutual friend this woman janet janet yang and uh, she's like, yeah, he's not going to meet with you. But he does want you to know that there was a pretty compelling landing case that took place in Africa. And I thought, yeah, right. And I didn't even look into it one second further. I just completely walked away from the, just dismissed it immediately. Because I said to myself, there's no way that there could be a landing and occupants getting out in broad daylight with over 100 witnesses and for the whole world not to have heard about it. So I just wrote it right off. And I think it was about 10 years before I even looked into it again. Um, and now I'm absolutely convinced, as is anyone else that looks at the evidence, that it actually happened. Um, and going to the actual landing site, and funny enough, like I've had like five or six different executive producers on this project, as is with most films I've made. And I remember the first guy, I was trying to convince him into you know, flying all these witnesses in and bringing them together for the first time in 20 years. And he's going, you mean to tell me that a flying saucer landed and the occupants bullshit? <laughs> like, I said, no, just hold on a second. Look at this compelling fil film footage back in the 90s of the children. Look, please. <laughs> so it's been an uphill battle the whole way. And, 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 and going to Africa and going to the landing site and meeting additional witnesses there and talking to now the headmistress, who at the time was a teacher, Judy Bates, it's a slam dunk. That, that case is absolutely phenomenal it brought back the memories of i remember the story but the way you retell it and get the new interviews is what's incredible just to follow up on this experience and you could see it in their eyes that something something happened that they they can't explain and they're still moved by that experience and i'm kind of jealous if if i were in school i sure would want that to happen to us i'm envious of these kids whether they took it one way or the other. What was your impression? Where, did they feel uh, humbled and uh, grateful for their experience? You know, it, it, one of the aspects of, of the encounter, uh, unfortunately, and I don't know why, did not make it into the movie. And that is their description when they were adults and they had time to kind of reflect back on what had happened and they were obviously more articulate and, and could 
you know, describe in better detail the experience. And they all agreed that if you've ever been out in nature, out in the wilderness, and you have a really, really rare encounter with a wild, with a wild animal, there's that moment of intrigue and curiosity, that standoff, where it's it's a benign encounter, but both parties are kind of frozen and curious and 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 just wanting to know and learn. They said that's what it was like with these beings, and that they had these these uh, logs that would define the outer perimeter of the playground. That the children were not allowed to go beyond these logs because uh, the, the grounds weren't uh, maintained and there were snakes and stuff that could potentially be harmful to the children. So they were allowed to go to this, all the way to these logs. And the children would go as children, you know, being children, and they would dance and skip along these logs at the right at the far edge of the playground. And these, a couple of the children had recounted that when they were skipping along these logs, the beings were joyfully doing the same thing, sort of mimicking their behavior. And that, that also didn't, but, you know, it sounds unbelievable. And I would say to anyone out there, <laughs> I totally get it if you don't believe this happened. I believe me, I didn't believe it. But when you look at the evidence, you look at the testimony, you review previous cases, previous landing cases, um, there's significant evidence that this event occurred. It, it definitely does seem so, and you could kind of fill it in your gut. Now, you've come out with some of these uh, these stories, but just because of the stories, you're not only bringing that forward, but you're bringing new evidence for paperwork, documents of these reported landing sites. How did you come across some of these reports that have never seen by the public before? Well, you know, we had tremendous level of participation and, 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 and help behind the scenes. And I mean, a lot of people were pulling a lot of strings behind the scenes. I mean, like I said, Jacques Vallée has been on board for several years now. Uh, he's been bringing out his file cabinets, putting me in touch. All the researchers have uh, made their research and their contacts available to us. Um, it's been the stars lined up, that's all I can say. And, and it's just one of those moments where it was a group effort. Everyone got, got on board and... Um, and made a miracle happen is all I can tell you. I don't know how else to say it. Did you watch the film? I sure did. Uh, I got the screener sent to me, and I was uh, fascinated through the whole thing. What really got me is that the level of detail that you go through, how long did it actually take you to edit this, and where did you even think about beginning? Okay, so seven years. I've been editing the edit room for three and a half years, and the version that you're looking at now is about one fiftieth as good as the version that's coming out in about a week. And the reason being is we hired, uh, uh, we did, we're doing color correction all the way through, attention to detail to all the lower thirds, all the graphics, all that uh, imagery stuff has been combed through for I don't know two and a half months now, two months. Uh, we hired a sound engineer who's won eight Emmy awards. He works with James Cameron because. This is going to get a theatrical release, and so we decided, and that's one of the reasons why it got delayed a little bit, we didn't submit the film on time, but I figured it was well worth the wait, because in the theater, there's a certain level of expectation that the audience has, and if you don't deliver on that, they might not be able to pinpoint what it is that bothers them, but something will bother them, because, you know, you're in a theater, you expect a certain level. So we decided to go ahead and do a complete, which took another six weeks. So the version that's coming out in about a week or 10 days is so much tighter. And then all the shots that we desperately tried to get into the film that were just, you know, 10 out of 10 shot, scene, statement, whatever, from around the world, China, from Belgium, from uh, South America. Uh, we made a little collection and then we did a really cool title sequence at the end. So you have titles, then you have statements, then you have titles and statements and montages. It's really, really, really cool. So um, it's been seven years. And I'd say at least half of that has been in the edit room and painstakingly going over. Like I, I laugh oftentimes people like go to tie their shoe when they're watching the film. I'm like, okay, you just missed about six months of work <laughs> because every frame has been carefully thought out. I'm not kidding. It really. Yeah. If it's going to be, as you say, with these improvements that 
what's going to be seen on the big screen from what I already saw. I can't even imagine how much better it could get, but this uh, sounds pretty exciting. Uh, I'm hoping maybe I could get it on the big screen myself. Let me ask you, it was kind of perfect timing now with the DOD admitting that they were doing an investigation into the UFO phenomenon uh, for approximately, I'm not sure, what was it, about 10 years, $20 million dollars. Now they're admitting that there's something in the skies that they, they don't know what's going on. And you uh, integrate this new news and uh, this new secret program of the investigation into the documentary. How did that all come to fruition when you started working on it seven years ago on this new information that's coming out? Well, we were in the depths of editing. And in fact, I think I might have maybe either just got back from Australia or maybe I just Maybe I got back from Africa. I can't remember. But in any case, that New York Times article dropped at the end of 2017. And that was a huge big deal. And I was like, oh, okay, wow. I had a kind of a feeling that something good was going to happen before the end of this film. But I didn't think it was going to be this good. So I had to go back to the investors and say, guys, we got to take another year. we got to document this whole development. And so we went after the key players. And that took some time. And, and it was quite tenuous at best at times, but we miraculously pulled that one off. I mean, getting an interview with Senator Harry Reid and the stuff that he says on camera, that was a, a wow moment for me because I don't know if you recall, I call it the, 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 the plastic water bottle moment where I ask him a pretty profound question. It's something that we've all suspected has been going on. And he takes a moment, undoes the cap, takes a sip, puts the cap back on, and then delivers the punchline, which was, I mean, I, I, I had to pinch myself sitting down at the time because, you know, that's about as close to his closure as I've ever heard. Yeah, it's, yeah you're going to have to see the movie to find out this punchline, but let me tell you, it's, it's a jaw dropper. And what's incredible to me as well is that the information that's getting out and that we're all on board and that's what we at Third Phase of Moon's about is getting the information out as fast as possible. But to sit on a project for seven years uh, is something that's, you know, takes some time and a lot of patience, but you did it right. You got the, you got the information coming in. Had you got any kind of, you know, pushback, any kind of warnings not to come out with this documentary? No, uh, we, um, we know that, you know, we're stepping on some pretty big toes. I know that Senator Harry Reid got a lot of pushback from the intelligence communities when, when he wanted to launch ATIP and put some funding into, into the, the whole phenomenon. Uh, but we have some uh, pretty significant uh, people behind us on this film. So I feel kind of a lot more comfortable at ease about it all. And I think there's a certain level of participation that's happening for whatever reason. One could speculate. I think there, there's uh, a handful of people that think that it's time for this, this reality to come out. It seems to be coming out. And uh, like I said, the stars aligned and we got unprecedented level of participation at all um, government and military uh, people. And, uh, you know, now we're getting a theatrical release, which is just, I mean, it's been a lifelong dream of mine. I mean, I tried with the last four documentaries on the topic to do this and, and we finally looks like we finally succeeded. Well, let me tell you, getting to the big screens, no easy feat. We, uh, did it last year and the DCP process, the VPF fees and the whole uh, aspect of it is uh, monstrous. Just even try and comp comprehend getting the film into the big screen, but congrats on that. And uh, I'm sure these improvements are going to make it an incredible experience to watch it on the big screen. Let me ask you this. Do you think now that we have the sixth military branch, the Space Force, uh, we're going to be even getting more of these videos coming in from the State Department, the DOD, or are they going to keep it silent? Because even these videos, sounds like it's the tip of the iceberg. Well, what I, funny enough, I, I didn't realize this when we got former Deputy Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, Christopher Mellon, which was months of, of back and forth before we finally um, made that happen. And I didn't know when I went to meet with him in D.C. that he was instrumental in getting those tapes out of the Pentagon. And they basically, they didn't break the law, but they bent the rules, they found a loophole, and they walked them out of the Pentagon. But there are so many more, from what I'm told, of that haven't been released. Really good, unambiguous, wonderful shots and film footage. 
Um, I know that the Navy confirmed that those were bona fide, unidentified aerial phenomena, but they said that we would not have released them to the public. I'm very curious to know who can actually authorize it, because one of the things I keep learning over and over again is that it doesn't even seem that our elected representatives have control of this. It, it's kind of baffling to me. It's like, well, who has the authority to have this stuff released? And everyone's like, oh, well, the president, but I don't think he does. I, I'm not sure who does. And I'm not sure what it's going to take to get the real good evidence out of there. Because I can tell you, the stuff that we have is good. That we're featuring in the film, but the stuff that's not been released is like, you know, landings. I, I know it. They have, land, they have footage of landings. I, I know they do. This is what the world is waiting for. Sure, these videos are compelling, but it sounds like what they have that they're not sharing with us would be basically smoking gun proof. I'm just wondering if there's some kind of possible whistleblower, uh, if the program would actually work for in some kind of case like this. I know it involves uh, national security at points when they're uh, shutting down nuclear missiles, when they have UFO encounters. Uh, so there might be a national security issue, but then there is that whistleblower protection act. I'm just wondering if that would be the avenue that maybe someone could take and get these videos released. You know, I think that with films like the phenomenon and efforts coming from the civil, from us, the people, um, arming people with information and educating them as to what's been going on. A lot of people think that, oh, it's obviously just some sort of new phenomenon. And that's one of the reasons why I went into the historical pr perspective, not to bore the, um, you know, the UFO community with more, you know, stuff. We put a lot of new, great, wonderful material in archive material. But I did it because if we were to penetrate a much broader audience, a much more mainstream audience, one would have to assume that they don't have the information um, the background history on the topic to even remotely consider the likelihood of the landing at Ruiz, Zimbabwe. So we felt more than just compelled. We felt it was a man. It was mandatory for us to cover the history. We kind of jokingly called it eating our spinach when we were doing it. Eat your spinach, audience. So we had just the right amount of spinach so we could educate the population better as to as to what's been going on and the shift in policy and why the secrecy and how the secrecy and how it's all come about um, so that they know that programs like ATIP that ended up on the front page of the New York Times is, is not uh, the first program nor will it be the last.